Welcome to the Microgen DX Miked Up Podcast. Discover how cutting-edge next-generation sequencing technology is revolutionizing medical diagnosis, empowering healthcare professionals with rapid and accurate identification of microbes. Our experts take you through the science behind microbiome testing so that you can make better decisions when it comes to patient care. Plus, hear stories from patients firsthand about their journey toward better health. Let's get started. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Martin. I'm the CEO of Microgen Diagnostics, and I'm joined by our VP of Medical Affairs, Nick Sanford. And Cliff, uh, again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to, as an infectious disease physician to help us educate the medical community on, on uh, next-gen sequencing and its clinical application in medicine and some of the Kind of issues we've run into as we've as we've introduced this to medicine. So let's, I guess, we'll start by just why don't you tell everybody a little bit about about your background? Sure, I'd be happy to. So thanks, Rick, and thanks, Nick. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you guys today. Um, so my name is Dr. Clifford Martin. I'm an infectious diseases physician, largely in private practice in Tucson, Arizona, where I've spent my whole career after doing my uh, medical school training here at the University of Arizona and my internship at New York University Bellevue, came back to Tucson and finished my internal medicine residency and infectious diseases fellowship here and then went into largely private practice for the last uh, 15 years or so in Tucson. I have a clinical appointment at the University of Arizona in the Department of Medicine and over the years have worked with fellows that have rotated in a variety of places with us. Um, and, but my, my large, the largest part of my day job has really been at the second largest hospital in Tucson where over the last 15 years I've served in a variety of roles as an infectious diseases physician, uh, medical director of infection control and prevention, um, overseeing the clinical aspects of the microbiology lab, uh, being involved in and then chairing the Quality and Safety Council, which oversaw all of the quality initiatives and safety initiatives of hospital of this size, um, and then Chief of Staff um, and uh, uh, during the COVID pandemic, so was at the helm of the medical staff of uh, several hundred physician medical staff during that critical time and was uh, fortunate to be able to uh, help lead the efforts here in Tucson as a result of that. Um, and in, in those roles, like many infectious disease physicians, I see patients largely on a daily basis, uh, served on the board of trustees of the hospital and the quality committee of the hospital and also the finance committee of the hospital at various times. And the reason I wanted everybody to know all of those things is like many infectious disease doctors, we wear a lot of hats and I've been able to see um, the implications of not only bedside care, but also financial decisions and hospital systems uh, decisions when it comes to adopting and implementing new technology when it uh, comes to taking care of our patients in the 21st century. So, uh, which is what led me to do some consulting with NextGen, which has really been a delight. And I'm looking forward to talking with everybody a little bit about my uh, perspectives on it, my experience with it, the evolution of how I've used it and how our institution uses it and uh, what I think should be done uh, much more broadly going forward. So I think that's that's probably a good start, Rick. Yeah, very good. So, uh, you know, Microgen DX obviously offers uh, next gen sequencing, and we could go into an elaborate discussion about what exactly is next gen sequencing versus PCR technology. But I think it would be good to have the audience hear from you how you would explain to a physician colleague exactly what is next-gen sequencing in terms of microbial detection? Obviously, you hear about next-gen sequencing with cancer diagnostics, but you're in the world of infection, so why, sure. Why kind of sure, yeah. So the, the way I generally start is by pointing out to my colleagues that you know we've been using the same technology for microbiologic diagnosis for 100 years, if not longer, when it comes to in vitro culture and sensitivities, with a few minor tweaks that have made it a little easier to detect some organisms that you know, in decades past were a little bit more difficult to grow. But as the rest of medicine has been advancing in diagnostics and therapeutics, and in a lot of ways, infectious disease diagnostics has remained a little bit stagnant. Certainly PCR has uh, come along and made a huge difference in a lot of our diagnostics. Um, but it still relies on the clinician to have a very well thought out differential diagnosis and to be able to select the pathogen or the pathogen panel that they're looking for and be able to order the specific test in order to identify those pathogens. So 
if you were looking for Canada Aureus, you could order a Canada Aureus PCR. Or for example, in our facility, if you were um, now having a, if you had a patient with meningitis or encephalitis, you would order a meningitis encephalitis panel that would give you a relatively rap a very rapid PCR result of the pathogens that are included in that panel and, and really able to make a much more rapid and accurate diagnosis of potentially life-threatening things, you know, streptococcus pneumoniae, listeria, which has always been a little more difficult to diagnose and also, you know, narrow down therapy to treat some fungal infections like cryptococcus or focus your, your treatment on viral pathogens if those are detected on encephalitis panels. But all of this technology, while, while very new and very exciting, comes with a cost, but it also comes with the limitations of being limited to specifically what those panels contain. So a PCR will detect what it's designed to detect. And, and uh, if you have a pathogen that's causing an infection, then uh, it's not included in that panel, you don't have any additional information. So uh, it's a little bit rudimentary of an explanation, I think, for most infectious disease specialists, but it sort of captures where we've been and where we've come. And uh, you know, maybe a little side note. Well, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I took a, a course in uh, DNA sequencing, and it was a really very fascinating course with uh, a lot of pipetting and little tubes and a lot of error. And when I was a medical student, I bumped into that same TA who was uh, since a PhD researcher. And he said, you know, Cliff, uh, that exact course that you took, that entire course five years later is now one single hour lecture. So in the matter of five years, things advanced that fast. And that was 15 years ago. Yeah. So imagine what we've come to now. So that's the background I give people. Next generation sequencing is really the next level when it comes to diagnosis. It has an infinitely more powerful uh, possibility of making diagnosis of what seems to be an almost unlimited array of pathogens. So rather than relying on a PCR panel that's either selected by a lab or selected, selected by a particular vendor, Nick can talk a little bit more to this, but what it does is take any specimen that you're able to send to the lab and it will tell you if the 16S ribosomal DNA is detected from a database of about 57,000 different potential pathogens. So it eliminates the ambiguity of knowing which vendor to choose. It eliminates the ambiguity of not knowing whether or not you have a pathogen that's not included in your PCR panel. And it lends itself to much more sensitive testing. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about what to do with that sensitivity and what that means for specificity later in the conversation. But in my opinion, uh, this technology, uh, next generation DNA sequencing, particularly the way that, that NextGen does it, is really the next generation of diagnostic testing to get more accurate and rapid diagnosis for our patients in a very cost-effective way. Okay, great. And, and Nick, did you want to add something to that? or? I think Dr. Martin hit the nail on the head um, when he starts talking about the bias that's introduced through PCR assays, because they, they are incredibly sensitive. A theoretical limit of detection of uh, a, a single colony or a single organism. Um, but the problem lies in the design of that panel. I mean, is uh, you can make uh, targets that are certainly clinically relevant or even syndromic panels that might be good. But I think what we're seeing or what we're starting to see with you know climate change and everything that's going on, emerging diseases are starting to balloon. And we're seeing a lot more opportunistic pathogens come about. So I think these syndromic panels that are limited to asking questions about 30 or so organisms are a very incomplete picture. And uh, Cliff, this obviously is a huge, as we've talked in the past, this is a huge shift for medicine. Um, and, uh, and even when you first were introduced to it, um, you, you were skeptical because again, there's the whole interpretation issue. Why don't, why don't you talk briefly about um, you know, that, that whole initial um, you know, thought process that you went through and, and some of, what some of the kind of concerns you had? Yeah, you bet. You bet. So Rick and I, you and I met probably about a decade ago, if not longer, when you were first uh, introducing this technology to, uh, to me and to my partners here. And we, like many infectious disease specialists, had a lot of skepticism about the sensitivity and specificity of the test. So if you use next generation DNA sequencing on um, on um, specimens that are collected from skin or soft tissue, 
uh, from uh, urinary tracts, from oral pharyngeal specimens, et cetera, et cetera. The sensitivity of detecting all different kinds of organisms is incredibly high and incredibly accurate. But infectious disease doctors have been trained to look at what the right treatment is for the right bug and the right patient at the right time. And we have been trained to have a certain amount of skepticism or even fear or reluctance to um, look for things that might lend ambiguity to those clinical decisions. So like many infectious disease doctors, I was getting referrals from wound care centers where uh, people were sending next generation DNA sequencing, uh, uh, sen sending wound swabs for next generation DNA sequencing and, and identifying a bunch of different things that mostly were commensals. And it was resulting in a lot of overtreatment. And for a variety of reasons, that's concerning. Um, but the biggest reason is, I think, that because of cost and because of antimicrobial resistance and because of payment structures, we've been overly conditioned to be worried about that. So I was resistant at first. Uh, I was uh, afraid of seeing overusage and I was afraid of seeing overtreatment. Over the last 10 years though, I've really kind of landed the other end of the spectrum. I was thinking today before we got together for this meeting of, of the first patient that really made me scratch my head and realize the utility of this. It was shortly after I met you, Rick, and I had a, a young patient and I have to be honest at this point, I don't remember if he had a native knee septic arthritis or a prosthetic knee septic arthritis. It's been a number of years and I, I couldn't pull his name up, but he had a nagging uh, uh, in, inflammatory process in his knee that was just really bothersome. He was an athlete, he was limited in his mobility and he had a clear effusion and had undergone multiple um, diagnostic and therapeutic arthrocentesis over a period of many months and had received courses of antibiotics by preparing primary care physician and his orthopedic surgeon and had not had any alleviation of his symptoms. Um, a couple of times he had had brief improvement in symptoms, but didn't really make a difference. So over the course of maybe a year and a half, we repeated arthrocentesis a few times under the guidance of his orthopedic surgeon, nothing ever grew. Uh, inflammatory markers were remarkably negative, which was really interesting. Uh, serum, CRP, and SED rate were normal. And I started to worry about the fact that maybe he had a rheumatologic process, uh, with normal inflammatory markers, et cetera, et cetera. So I decided to go ahead and send a specimen to you all. And he and the, the specimen rapidly developed, uh, detected a peptostreptococcus. Well, this was revolutionary. It really was for this patient. I mean, this is a patient who had undergone numerous invasive procedures, including one arthroscopic washout and several courses of empiric antibiotics without any improvement. When we identified the peptostreptococcus, it wasn't viable in culture, but I did convince the orthopedic surgeon to do another arthroscopic whiteout, and I put the patient on high dose penicillin and I treated him for six weeks and he was cured. Wow. So it was, it was really a turning point in my thinking about when to appropriately use this test. So I can, and, and maybe later on in this conversation, we'll talk about some of the other interesting cases that I've been able to make a much more rapid diagnosis with by using it more liberally. But what I started doing is using it much more liberi liberally in uh, closed space infections and in surgical specimens and in, in situations where uh, it would be difficult to make a diagnosis if you missed the opportunity. I've used it in a variety of situations with spinal abscesses and uh, potential discitis, osteomyelitis of the spine. We've used it pretty liberally now in uh, CSF specimens. And I've even used it in a variety of situations, for example, a tubo ovarian abscess that was removed and we had a one stop, and we had a one opportunity to make the diagnosis. And I was pretty sure that we were gonna identify characteristic pathogens, but I recognized that if we missed the diagnosis, that the ovary would be gone and it would be very difficult to make a diagnosis going forward. And it turns out that this has been a very successful strategy. Um, the, the, the caveat is that um, if, you, if you use it in other situations, which we can talk about as well, and ear, nose, throat infections, oral pharyngeal infections, urinary infections, inner abdominal infections, you do have to use a certain amount of clinical expertise and thoughtful approach to the things that you identify because many of them won't require treatment and it's a clinical decision in those situations about whether something is pathogenic or not. But even in those situations, I've, become, I've come to use it much more liberally, not always as a first pass, but in situations where patients are still suffering, where they clearly have an ongoing inflammatory process and it's imperative to alleviate the infection and alleviate their suffering. 
And once again, we can talk about a variety of those things, but we're using it very liberally in those situations now. And while I would be the first one to say that uh, the majority of the time I don't learn any new information that I wouldn't have learned on culture. But if you look at the cost versus the opportunity in a smaller number of patients to make a diagnosis quickly and avoid repeat courses of antibiotics, repeat surgical interventions, repeat orthopedic device revision surgeries. In that small number of patients where we really do make a difference and make a diagnosis early, I think that the cost benefit analysis overwhelmingly in favor of using next generation DNA sequence early and often. There was a study published um, several years ago now looking at the economic aspects of NGS and diabetic foot ulcers. And what they, what they found there was, uh, I think, an overall decrease by 73% in cost of healing. And what I thought was interesting about it is they spent 88% less, 88 less on the antimicrobials and like 66% less on debridement procedures because they were able to target their interventions quickly. Yes, I think that's really imperative. I, I think that the mantra of a severe diabetic foot infection, you need to cover for pseudomonas, you need to cover for uh, likely MRSA these days, and anaerobic coverage has to be very strongly considered and used very liberally. These are situations where very broad spectrum antibiotics are used in a very routine and regular basis on patients that likely don't need them. And pairing next generation DNA sequencing in those situations and appropriately collected specimens um, with adequate material can really lead to huge gains in antimicrobial stewardship and also with all the tentacles that come along with that, C. diff, multidrug resistance, treatment failures, et cetera. It really is a very powerful tool. My UTI was chronic. All of the culture tests I took for years did not find the cause of infection. I was a week and a half from them amputating my foot. Current testing methods typically use cultures, a method that presents limitations in identifying key organisms known to cause chronic infections. As I would see my patients, I knew I wasn't helping them because we were limited by traditional cultures. Microgen DX is a better test than culture because it uses the DNA from your urine, sinus, wound, or other infected sample and matches it to their database of more than 50,000 species of bacteria and fungi with a 99% accuracy. So I was a week and a half away from from not having a leg to being healed. Microgen DX gave me my life back. Ask your doctor about Microgen DX. If you're suffering from chronic or recurring urinary, sinus, wound, or implant infections, ask your doctor to use the most accurate testing available with Microgen DX DNA analysis. What would you recommend to your colleagues in terms of when they first start with a new technology like Microgen's Next Gen Sequencing? Yeah. And they get the first report and they see species that they've never even heard of. Um, and they're yeah. basically struggling with to make a clinical decision as to what to do with it. I'm sure maybe when you first saw it too, and obviously we talked about uh, in our initial discussions, you talked about using it in a closed space infection where you're not going to be in mostly from sterile sites. Um, where you're not going to be getting a lot of uh, different bacteria as if you took it from the urinary tract where you, we know now there's a urinary microbiome that you're going to, you're going to get everything that's in there. So let's we'll talk a little bit about how that, you know, that moving that transition from looking at culture reports where you single, see a single pathogen and an antimicrobial recommendation to now yeah. getting multiple species. Yeah. I think there's a couple of different ways to answer that question. So first as an infectious disease specialist, I am a strong advocate for more information is better. So many of my colleagues are reluctant to use diagnostic testing that has incredible sensitivity for detecting potential pathogens or detecting any organisms. And my response to that is that's what we're trained to do. We are trained to make decisions with ambiguous data. And despite the fact that we may have positive cultures or positive PCRs or positive next generation DNA sequencing, it's our job to sort through the noise decides what's pathogenic and choose an appropriate treatment and treat the patient, not the microbiology report. And I think that the sensitivity of this test in detecting organisms is immensely powerful. The sensitivity in detecting disease in the patient 
still depends on the positive predictive value of whether or not you think an infection is present. And then you also have to use your clinical judgment about whether the organisms that are detected are potentially pathogenic or not and make a clinical decision. And after that, follow-up is your best friend. So in many ways, it's exactly the way we were trained. But I tell all of my infectious disease colleagues that I am much more comfortable making those decisions with more microbiologic information than I am with little microbiologic information. And I, I, I've had most of my infectious disease colleagues recognize that. But the follow-up that they have is that infectious disease specialists are often not involved in these decisions preliminarily, or they're involved late in the game. And, it, and, 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 and that is a tr that's true. That's true. There, there certainly is overtreatment with any diagnostic testing. I mean, we've all seen overtreatment for MRSA in the urine. We've seen overprescription of antibiotics for MRSA abscesses that require incision and drainage. So this is not novel. This is just a new level of information to, to make that novelty more complex. So when I talk to systems about this, hospital systems in conjunction with you all, and I, and I talk to clinics, uh, I talk to microbiology laboratories that are based in hospitals, they have the same concerns. And so for me, it is an important, it's an important nuance that when you're dealing with complicated or unusual infections, early involvement of infectious disease specialists, either in choosing the appropriate diagnostic test or in interpreting it and making the right antibody decision is absolutely imperative. Uh, NextGen is, is, uh, graciously offers a service to anybody that is getting a report and doesn't know how to interpret it or is unfamiliar with the organisms that you can call and get an expert consult telephone call with any number of consultants that are willing to walk through the reports with you. So those resources are available. Um, but the answer, in my opinion, of uh, addressing this fear of overdiagnosis and overtreatment is not to lend a blind eye. That is fallacious logic, in my opinion. The, the, the right answer is to use a liberally early and appropriate settings, especially when you're trying to avoid patient harm and avoid unnecessary treatment, and then invo in, involve the right decision makers, namely infectious disease specialists, early in the diagnosis and treatment of it. Um, so a lot of time it depends on the cultures of the institution. There are a number of institutions where infectious disease physicians are champions of this and are working very closely with their surgeons and their interventionalists and their generalists. But I've also seen a number of institutions where those relationships in the culture doesn't lend to it. And the challenge is not in the testing. The patients need this. The challenge is in, uh, is in a, looking at those relationships, looking at those internal cultural the dynamics between specialists and recognizing that we now practice in an environment where medical knowledge is expanding at light speed. It's the team sport and it doesn't do us any good to turn a, a blind eye to technology that's going to help us treat the patient. The answer is to build the teams that you need and do appropriate multidisciplinary assessment and treatment of these patients. So that's the way I explain it, um, depending on who I'm talking to, but, but I, I think that in, in my world as an infectious disease specialist, we do a, a lot of lobbying and advocacy for multidrug resistant infections and for appropriate antimicrobials for infection prevention. I think that we also need to put the same emphasis on getting involved early with patients and working together with our colleagues and multi-specialty teams in order to make diagnoses and treat patients much more effectively. That has to be the center of what we do. What about, I mean, one thing we, we've heard from uh, uh, doing surveys of infectious disease physicians regarding kind of the, the barriers to bring this into medicine. And, yeah. um, and although we, you know, there's other options, there's Carius, there's University of Washington. Um, how much is the, the price point, which obviously Microgen is charging hospitals 350 and Medicare is 350 allowable. What, how much does that come into play? Was that a shock to you? when you heard the price point? Because some people start to think the price point, if it's that low, is it, is it, is it, is it good? <laughs> um, so <laughs> yeah. what's, what's your comment on that? Well, uh, the world of medical cost is a little bit um, confusing and um, probably uh, not, um, I, could say, I could say a lot about it um, in, in terms of the way that, that physicians and hospitals and labs and pharmaceuticals are reimbursed and paid for. It's rather a nightmare. Um, fortunately, I've had a little bit of an insight into that with the different roles I've had over the years, and, and the cost is a huge issue. So hospital budgets are uh, clearly strained. They were strained before COVID, they were strained during COVID, and they're strained in new and unique ways now. 
um, payment structures are really rapidly evolving. And I think that the trend towards what is called value payment and bundled payments is uh, making every uh, aspect of every healthcare system look at, at um, budgets in a siloed way that often doesn't serve the patient. So the microbiology budget is a huge issue. It is. I mean, I've been involved in situations in, in my hospital in particular, where we were sending out PCR panels to a reference hospital in our community and being charged $1,000, where we knew we could bring that technology in and do it ourselves for 150 And it took an immense amount of internal hand-wringing and budgetary analysis and a, an evaluation of staff and lab space to bring it in. And yet the second we did, it was a clear win. So with NextGen, it's the same thing, in my opinion. There are a couple of really strong points of the technology that your company has, Rick. I mean, first of all, uh, the price point is amazing. So there are a number of what I think you could call competitors out there, but the price point is three, five, ten times higher for less uh, broad technology. So some of the competitors you just mentioned will only take certain specimens. They'll only take blood or they'll only take tissue or they'll only, yeah, so, um, and, 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 and they'll charge $1,000 a specimen where you're charging a fraction of that. So getting that matches across is really critical. I, I think that you know, I, 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 as a, as, as a physician, I, one of the things that keeps me away at night is how I always have to look for prior authorization and look for the cheapest way to take care of my patients. It's, it's really very tricky. Um, I think that the secret sauce that you've identified, which makes me such a champion of this technology, is that uh, your, your lab is able to accept any specimen of any tissue, any body tissue, hey, um, toenails, skin, blood, cardiac biopsies, anything that's not formal and fixed. And that, that problem may be even solved in the near future, but at least for the right now, it's, it's anything that's not formal and fixed can be sent to you and you can get a next generation DNA result back in a very timely manner. Whereas if you use other clinics, your surgeon or the interventional radiologist who's collecting the specimen has to remember, oh wait, does um, this vendor, do they accept blood? Do they accept tissue? Do they accept bone? And they have to remember which one to send it to with an attention to cost that um, often doesn't give them the answer they want. Some panels out there that are competitors don't include fungi. Well, that takes a high level of critical thinking to think, am I really going to spend $1,000 on a next generation sequencing test that doesn't include fungi? And oh, by the way, did my surgeon sample the specimen that's appropriate for that lab? Or do I send all of them to a lab that has a much better price point and takes all specimens and is equally sensitive with a much broader database of potential pathogens? So um, talking it through on that level with the decision makers at every level is really critical. The, the thing, especially on a large institutional standpoint that I realized is that Little pieces of medical cost are often not easily moved when it comes to an annual budgetary process. But the issues of repeat surgeries, avoiding repeat readmissions, you know, multiple uh, revisions of orthopedic devices, uh, length of stay issues, bounce backs from skilled nursing facilities or long-term acute care facilities back to the hospital that are not reimbursed by payers, those things can become exceedingly expensive for healthcare systems. And if you can demonstrate that you have avoided one or two or half a dozen of those a year, then it becomes very easy to make a price um, argument for bringing this technology to a clinic or a hospital or a large system. There was a recent publication by the American Association of Clinical Chemistry that issued perspectives for microbiologists and clinicians and laboratory stewardship teams. And I thought the perspective of the stewardship team was uh, interesting because they did a, co a cost equivalency analysis and found that if uh, NGS was only positive in one out of every 25 cases and it prevented a brain biopsy or another day of hospital stay, cost equivalency was reached. And this was this analysis was done with some of our competitors with much higher price points. No, it's really very true. I mean, I think I, I, I see it on a daily basis now. And it would be a little bit fun to talk about some of these clinical examples if we have time. But the first one that came to my mind right now was a CSF specimen on an HIV patient who I had sent for next generation sequencing in addition to PCR and in addition to routine culture, the very rapidly identified, uh, identified nocardia. Well, that, that is a diagnosis that could have been life-threatening and would have been 
life-threatening, potentially lethal in this patient if it hadn't been made quickly. And there was no PCR panel available that included it. And I didn't have to think to myself, oh, does the particular vendor my hospital use accept CSF? It was a very rapid save. Um, and in my particular neck of the woods, coccidioid mycosis is a frequent pathogen that we worry about. And in some specimens, it's easy to culture and some it's not, but it's not included in meningitis and cephalitis panels. So it does lend itself to very rapid diagnosis and huge cost savings in, in a variety of clinical situations. I, I could go on about this because I get super excited about it, but I, I, you know, within the last six months had a, a prosthetic joint infection, a knee infection that very quickly grew E. coli. And it was a sensitive E. coli in vitro, but uh, the next generation DNA sequencing that the surgeon has sent within three, within five days came back with a low level pseudomonas um, as a secondary pathogen. I don't have an explanation as to why that didn't grow in the lab. I don't know if the specimen was discarded prematurely. I don't, I don't know. But it did lead to uh, a, a change in my management, my intravenous antibiotic therapy, and the patient did resolve his infection. And I'm convinced based on numerous times this happening in other patients where I didn't use next generation, that if you don't treat a potential pathogen that you have a, a suspicion is there, they will come back with a, either a secondary or persistent or resurgent infection in the future. And the list of these successes that I've had in my personal clinic, clinical practice is growing you know, by the month. Um, and the cost savings to, to virtually everybody involved, not the least of which is the patient, the cost of quality of life is huge. Or I'm just conscious of the time. We're at more than a half an hour, but um, I did have to. I want to ask you though. Um, so we get so many times where the insurance companies have come back and with a claim from their medical policy team that this is experimental, investigational, and denied coverage. Um, well, how would you respond to the, to those those policy boards that uh, yeah. have have that belief? Yeah. Well, Nick, Nick, Nick and I probably would have very complimentary answers to that question. But for me, this is not clearly not experimental. I mean, there are numerous labs that are providing similar services with much smaller panels at much higher price points, and they're being reimbursed. And while the technology is relatively new to some people, this is not, this is not, um, this is not, <laughs> it's not rocket science. It really mm -hmm. isn't. I mean, 16S amplification is not, this is not uh, an experimental treatment. We're not talking about infusing people. With, all right, I'm not going to get into my critique of many alternative medicine things that are paid <laughs> that really have no evidence and no clinical outcome studies. So the, the number of studies that are being published regarding next generation sequencing, including those that you have partnered with on a variety of reputable institutions is growing it's growing by the year. And there are numerous studies that we don't have to time, talk, time, time to talk about today that maybe we could talk about in the future if, if there's an interest in our audience to talk about what the data was, how the studies were set up and how it proved that early diagnosis and outcomes data is there for this technology. Um, and it's just a matter of getting the attention of the appropriate decision makers and showing them the appropriate evidence that, that is, really, is really the issue. It's, it's a little bit of a tragedy right now that uh, physicians are having to have conversations with their patient and telling the patient, we have a technology that can detect virtually any infection you have in a very rapid manner and can really change your prognosis for a positive outcome, but your insurance doesn't cover it. And so if you can't afford to pay for it out of pocket, we may have to do it the old clunky way. That's not very good medicine, in my opinion. It's, we, we've got to get there. Well, thank you so much, Cliff. Uh, any closing comments you want to th th uh, add? Or, um, But I think you've, you've obviously uh, helped a great deal, and I think this will be very valuable. No, I think that the only comment I would have is uh, wherever you're watching this, um, that uh, Rick and Nick and their team are very open to questions. I mean, if, if anyone is interested in learning more about this, whether it's the science behind it, whether it's the technology, whether it's clinical, uh, you know, clinical experience, et cetera, um, pick up the phone and call because that's how um, I've learned about it. And that's how I became a champion about it. And unless, unless you do it, um, you're going to be distracted <laughs> by any other number of pressures that we face every day. So I think that Rick and his company are very open to teaching people about this and learning how to use it appropriately. And I'm available to if, um, if they uh, need me to talk to you. Great. Thanks again. Appreciate it.
Thank you for tuning in to Microgen DX Miked Up. We hope that you found our broadcast informative and helpful. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about our services, please visit our website at microgendx.com. Power up your precision with Microgen DX testing, the key to accurate diagnostics and personalized treatments. Until next time, this is Microgen DX Miked Up signing off.